hope. Amen. Matthew chapter 18, verses 11 through 14. When you have it, I'd ask if you would please stand as we show our honor and respect for the reading of God's holy word. This is Jesus speaking. He says, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety-nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. This is the word of God. Let us pray. Lord, we do thank you and praise you for your word this morning. And we ask now, Father, that you would bring a fresh revelation to this text for us this morning in this place at this point in our lives for this season. Lord, we ask that I would move to the back and that you would move for the front and that you would be glorified in everything that is said. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat this morning. So if you've been with us for Advent, you know that we have been going through a series called To Seek and to Save. To Seek and to Save. And we've been talking about the real reason why Jesus came as a child and was born. The real reason we celebrate as Christians this holiday called Christmas. And it can be found in verse 11. In fact, it's based off of verse 11 of our passage here today and also verse, uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 10, in which Jesus said twice in the Gospels, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so we've been looking at different aspects of that, whether it be in those two passages or in different areas of the gospel of this ultimate rescue mission that Jesus was sent on by the Father for our benefit. And the first week we looked at Galatians 4.4 and John 3.17 and talked about how it was the ultimate rescue mission. That praise God, he did not have to bend his son's arm or twist his son's arm in order to come, but Jesus came into this world willingly to die on a cross for you and for me that we could be reconciled unto God. And that Jesus did not come into this world to condemn the world, but as we heard from Adam earlier today in the scripture reading for the candle, he came to save the world from our sins. After that, we looked at not just the ultimate rescue, but the reason for the rescue. And we determined that the saying that you hear a lot in this world of Jesus is the reason for the season is not 100% true. But that you are the reason for the season. Did you take note on that, Travis? Because Travis posted something different on Facebook last week and I had to correct him. (laughs) But that you are the reason for the season, right? In 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 15, the apostle Paul said that this is a trustworthy saying, that Jesus came to save sinners. Amen? (laughs) Amen. So if you're here this morning and you don't think you're that bad of a person, or if you're here this morning and you think you're inherently good, guess what? The Bible tells us that Jesus did not come for the righteous, but he came to save sinners. (laughs) And I'll gladly count myself amongst the transgressors so that way I can receive the grace of God and be healed by the blood of the Lamb, and I can be with him and reconciled with him in glory. You see, before the gospel becomes good news, you got to accept the bad news. You got to accept the broken news. You got to accept the harsh reality that we are all sinners and we could not achieve righteousness on our own. Oh, but the grace of God that He sent His Son into the world for you and sent him for me so that we may be saved. And we talked about that the whole reason for the season was that Jesus came for us. And we talked about what He gave up in order to get here, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says that he gave up all the riches of glory. He gave it all up and came to this earth for you and for me. Why? He made himself poor so that you and I could be rich. 
so that we could be sons and daughters of the Most High. What a glorious God we serve, amen? What a wonderful Savior that we have a relationship with, amen? A God of grace and a God of glory, a God of mercy. And then last week we looked at the method of rescue. And we look specifically in Luke chapter 19, not at a traditional Christmas passage about the story of Zacchaeus and how Zacchaeus' life completely got turned around. He went from being a Jewish man who was a tax collector who cheated his people and cheated his brothers and sisters and was in sin to being a man whose life completely got turned around. And how did his life completely got turned around? Because he climbed a tree and while he was trying to be unnoticed, Jesus called him out in the tree and Jesus spoke directly into his life and Jesus reminded him, no matter how much you try to hide, no matter how much you try to be away from me, I know you, Zacchaeus, and I know there's something better for you, Zacchaeus. He reminds him he's a son of Abraham. He reminds him, as in verse 10 of Luke 19, the whole theme of our series, that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And we said that we can look at that and we can see that same method that Jesus did not come to institute a whole new set of rules for us to follow. Amen? Jesus did not come to seek and to save by giving us a whole new list of commands that we need to do. In fact, no, Jesus took the Old Testament law and he condensed it down to two. Amen? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands hang all of the law of the prophets. He condensed it down to two. In fact, Jesus showed us in Zacchaeus, uh, with the story of Zacchaeus, that he did not come to seek and save by following a law, but he came to seek and save by having a personal relationship with each and every one of us. That he calls you by name. He reminds you that you have not been forgotten. And no matter where you are in life, he says, come down. I must go to your house today, for I've come for you. And it was that one moment in time with Zacchaeus that everything changed, and the man was redeemed. It was Jesus' method of rescue, a personal relationship. Not a distant, far-off God who we can wonder what he wants, but no, a close, personal God who knows the number of hairs on your head. He said, I know all about you, Zacchaeus. Whew. We talked about last week how that's both wonderful, right? And also scary. <laughs> There's nowhere we can go to hide. But he came for us, even in the midst of all of that. This morning, I want us to look at one last passage to wrap up our Seek and our Save series. And that's the passage we're looking at this morning. I want to look at the pursuit of the rescue. The pursuit of the rescue. You see, in this passage that we're looking at this morning, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And he's telling them in the previous verses in chapter 18 about God the Father's concern for his own. In fact, when Jesus talks about the sheep, right? When he talks about the parable of the lost sheep that we're going to be looking at today, he's actually referring to his own. He's referring to the nation of Israel. He's referring to his called out people. And he's telling the disciples and reminding his disciples of just how far and how great and how deep the Father's love is for them. And how the Father has a concern for him. And he's laying out just how far the Father's love stretches and just how much he's willing to do to bring reconciliation between him and his people. And what Jesus does is he lays it out in a very applicable way. He tells the story of a lost sheep. And the story of the shepherd that would go out to find that last sheep. By this story, he tells us the pursuit that God has for you and for me this Christmas season. The pursuit that continues even today. It's not just 
at Christmas time, but it's a daily thing, day in and day out, until ultimately we go home to be with the Good Shepherd. And listen to me, church, while Jesus is talking specifically to the nation of Israel, spiritually it's applicable to you and to me. And so there are some things about the pursuit of the lost sheep by the Good Shepherd that I want you to notice this morning that hopefully will make you of good cheer as we enter into the most holiest of nights on Tuesday. The first thing I want you to see, and like I said, we're going we're gonna to probably just mostly settle in verse 12 because there's a lot there that you and I can learn about. But the first thing I want you to notice here is that Jesus pursues the one that was lost. Jesus pursues the one that was lost. Look with me at verse 12. Jesus says, How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety-nine, and goeth to the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? First thing I want you to notice from that verse is that it was the sheep who strayed from the shepherd. It was the sheep who strayed from the shepherd. Now why do I want you to see that? Well, because it gives you something to relate to. You see, Isaiah chapter 53 says that we are all like sheep, (laughs) and we have all gone astray. And if you know anything about sheep, whether you're a farmer or if you've studied the biblical idea of sheep and the shepherds, you know that sheep are not the smartest animals that are out there. Don't be offended, all right? I'm just as much a sheep as you are a sheep today. And some of us are more mangy than others, but that's okay. The shepherd will still clean and shear all of us, amen? And use for his kingdom. But what I want you to see this morning is that it says, if any man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray. Notice the sheep went off on its own. The shepherd didn't get rid of the sheep, but the sheep wandered. Now, why would a sheep wander from the shepherd? Well, just like you and me in this world, why do we wander from the shepherd? Well, uh, there could be a bunch of reasons. Maybe it was distracted by something, right? It says that it went into the mountains. In Luke chapter 15, in another telling of the parable, it says that it went into the wilderness. Maybe there was something out away from the green pastures that looked better or caught its attention or maybe beckoning it out. But either way, it got distracted and was pulled away from the shepherd and the rest of the flock. Or maybe, and this is where I relate to the sheep, it was aimlessly wandering. Maybe it just had its head down and it was eaten and eaten and eaten, and let's be honest, men, sometimes we can just put our head down and focus on the food and not necessarily know where we're going or what we're doing. I just know I've got good food in front of me, (laughs) and I ain't paying attention to anything else. Amen. Joe knows what I'm talking about. (laughs) Right? It just aimlessly wandered. And after a while, after having its head down and eating and eating and eating, it noticed, where is everybody? It got away from the shepherd and it got away from the flock. Or maybe the sheep was stubborn. Now, I think we have some people in here that could probably relate to that, right? The shepherd maybe kept calling out, hey, don't go over there. Hey, sheep, get back over here. Hey, don't go over on those mountains. Hey, it's not safe over there. And the sheep decided, I know better and I'm not going to heed the warning of the shepherd. There's something I want. And sooner or later, the shepherd or the sheep noticed I'm not with the group anymore. It didn't listen to the voice. Or maybe the sheep never fully connected with the shepherd. Listen to me on this one. Maybe it never fully connected with the rest of the flock. Maybe it felt like a black sheep. Right? that it was an outcast, it didn't belong. And because it was not taken in or because it didn't feel like it was connected, it decided, well, maybe I'm gonna go off and look for another group to be a part of where my needs will be met. 
I don't know what the reason may be this morning, church, but I think we can all associate with that because like Isaiah 50 said, all of us are like sheep and we have gone astray. <laughs> for some reason or another. For some reason, we've left the flock at some point. For some reason or another, we have walked away from the shepherd, gotten at a great distance from the shepherd. But what I want you to see is that it was the sheep that left. It wasn't the shepherd. The shepherd's where he's supposed to be. The shepherd's with the other 99. The shepherd is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The good shepherd's trying to keep an eye on his flock and keep things away. He's got them all together. It was the sheep who decided to go off this morning. Maybe you're that sheep today. Maybe you've wandered from the shepherd. Maybe you've wandered from the flock and you have found yourself out in the middle of the mountains. You have found yourself in unfamiliar land or unfamiliar territory. You found yourself hurting and vulnerable and wanting to find something better. Or maybe you have found yourself in a predicament now that you've wandered off and you're by yourself. You're scared. You're alone. Maybe you've gotten injured. You've fallen into a pit. But you've noticed, I'm not where I'm supposed to be in the presence of my shepherd. I want to tell you this morning, church, the whole entire story of Christmas is about how the shepherd went to find the sheep. How the shepherd went to find the sheep. And that's the second thing I want you to see this morning from verse 12, is that the shepherd, when they noticed the sheep was gone, went to get the sheep. He went to get the sheep. Look, it says... Doth he not leave the ninety and nine and go? Does he not leave the ninety and nine to go? Now, why is it important for you to see that the shepherd went to get the sheep? Well, first off, I want you to see that it shows that the shepherd is concerned for the one. Even though he has ninety-nine others. It shows us that no matter how large the flock was of the shepherd, he knew one was missing. In other words, you individually, personally, are important to the shepherd. He notices your absence. How many of you guys, maybe I can put it like this, have ever been at home and it's been an absolute long day? And all you want to do is to go home, get in your pajamas, get your favorite snack and beverage, sit down on the couch, and watch your favorite television show. And so you gather all of that stuff up, and you sit down, and you go to reach on the end table and to get the remote to turn on the television, and the remote's not there. I cannot tell you how many times that happens in my house with four kids. And you start zeroing on in because that one thing is missing, is ruining everything. Right? Now, this is a modern day problem because back in the day when I was like seven or eight, I was my father's remote control. And maybe I need to start learning that. I, I don't know, but I remember my dad would be like, hey, I don't want to watch this channel anymore. Hey, flip through until uh, there's something on that I, I, I want to, you know, yeah, there's TV boxes, right? Yeah, I was my father's remote. But nowadays that doesn't work, right? And so you start searching for the TV remote. You're focused in on it. And listen to me, it doesn't matter how many years you have been married. You could be married for 40 years and have built up so much trust in your partner but if they're sitting on that couch, and you say, are you sitting on the remote? And they say no, you look at them and you say, oh, get up. <laughs> Why? Because you are insistent. You don't trust anybody. I'm going to find that remote. And for us, it can be under the couch, in the cushions. It could be, you know, uh, tucked away. Now with a dog, he likes to grab it. We've got teeth marks on our remote. 
But eventually you find that remote, right? You're zeroed in on that one thing that's going to complete the process. Listen to me, church. When it comes to the shepherd trying to find the sheep, that shepherd, no matter, even though he's got his favorite snack and his favorite beverage and he's in his comfy clothes, you are the remote to that shepherd when you go astray. You are that one thing that completes the entire problem. Doesn't matter, it's everything else. The shepherd needs you. Because you are unique. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are that sheep that completes the flock. He says, I'm going after it. I don't trust anyone else. I'm going after it after he shows the concern for you listen to me church he knows he cares he loves and he's concerned for you and if you were the only one who sinned in the entire history of this world on this earth he still would have sent his son to die on a cross for your sake so that way you could be redeemed he came after you it shows that you don't go unnoticed in the presence of the shepherd, but he's concerned for the individual. It's not like the shepherds say, well, you know, I still got 99. <laughs> what's, what's one that wanders off? Nah, that's not how our God moves and how our God works. There's a place for everyone in the kingdom of God. There's a place for everyone in the sheep pen, amen? Amen. Listen to me, church. Not only that, but you know what verse 12 shows us? It shows that not only is the shepherd concerned for the individual sheep, no matter how large the flock is, it also shows us that it was the shepherd that went after the sheep. You may be saying, Pastor Jeff, you already said that. No. Let's put it on a different emphasis. It was the shepherd who went after the sheep. It's important for you to realize that because notice it doesn't say that the shepherd sent a hireling to go after the sheep. Notice it doesn't say that they brought in somebody else to go into the mountains where it's dangerous to find the sheep. But no, he went himself. The shepherd took responsibility for his sheep that went lost. And he went out to find them. Notice also it doesn't say that the shepherd waited for the sheep to return. He knew the sheep was probably too dumb to find its way back. Can I get an amen? amen? Listen to me, church. He went after it himself. He did not wait for the sheep to return, but rather he initiated the search. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life when there was nothing that we could do to initiate salvation on our parts, praise God that the Father Almighty sent His Son into the world to initiate salvation for you and for me. He did it. He didn't send anyone else. Buddha's not out there looking for the sheep. Muhammad's not out there looking for the sheep. The Pope is not out there looking for the sheep. Listen to me, church. Only one that's looking for the sheep and the only one that can find the sheep and the only one that can save the sheep is Jesus Christ Almighty, the Good Shepherd. He's the only one that knows his sheep. And notice, and here's the message. It's what the angel said to Mary, right? Matthew 1.21. It says, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. It's Jesus who is that good shepherd. In fact, the name Jesus means he who saves. And can I give you one more thing, church, this morning from that? By the fact that it's the shepherd that went out for the sheep. Notice, he did not let the 99 take precedent over the one. That's a tough one for us as a church, we need to remember. Especially when it comes to evangelism, especially when it comes to reaching out to the community. Notice, he did not let the precedent of the, or the, the care of the 99 take precedent over the one that was lost. 
You know, sometimes we forget that church is not a country club, but rather it's a ministry. It's not about what we want and our desires, but it's about reaching those who are on the outside and are not a part of the body and do not know Jesus. We should be willing to make ourselves uncomfortable and without for the sake of taking the gospel to a lost, broken, and dying world and finding the sheep that are lost. That is where the priority is. And that was the priority of the shepherd. He knew the 99 were safe. He knew they were already in. Let's go find the one. Let's go find the one. Not only does he go after the sheep, but I want you to also see in the verse, it says that the shepherd is willing to go to the mountains. The shepherd is willing to go to the mountains to find the sheep. Look, it says, and goeth into the mountains. I love it when verses are self-explanatory like that. But let me give you a little more insight into what that means. The mountains were not a safe place for a sheep. So whatever reason he decided to go and whatever reason the sheep went out from the pasture and whatever reason the sheep was in rocky ground, the sheep is now in the mountains and has put itself in danger. It is not with the shepherd to ward off predators. It is not with the rest of the sheep to keep itself company, but rather it is alone and whether it is vulnerable. It is in a foreign land. But what I want you to see is that no matter how far the shepherd went or the sheep went and no matter how dangerous of a territory the sheep is in, praise God, the shepherd was willing to go where the sheep was. Mm. Sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? You know, kind of like the season that we're celebrating. What did Paul say in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7? It says, Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. In other words, Jesus Christ came down into a dark, broken, and sinful world and put on a sack of flesh. He went into the proverbial mountains to find the sheep that had strayed. He put himself in harm's way, even harm's way of death on a cross to rescue and save the sheep that wandered away from the pen church. I don't know about you, but I'm forever indebted to the work of the shepherd who came and paid my way and died on a cross and saved me when I was in uncharted territory so that way I could be brought back in praise God from whom all blessings flow that the shepherd went to the mountains and brought back a lost mangy sheep what's that song that we hear sung from some contemporary people I believe the lyrics go how many kings step down from their thrones I don't know the next part, I just know that one. How many kings step down from their thrones? Come on, man. Born to die for you and me. He came into this world when he did not have to. He was not of this world, but he made himself of this world to rescue you and to me. The shepherd was willing to go into the mountains. Can I tell you, church, you may find yourself today lost and separated from God. You may think that you're in a place where God cannot find you and God cannot rescue you. You may think you've gotten yourself tangled up into some stuff and the enemy is knocking at your door and you're all alone and you're crying out and nobody's answering. And it seems as if the enemy's getting ready to devour you. Maybe you've been cut down and injured. Can I tell you? Hold on. The shepherd is on his way. There's no place that he wouldn't be willing to go. Why? Because the text also tells me that the shepherd is patient and persistent in his pursuit. The shepherd is patient and persistent in his pursuit. Look at what it says. It says, and he goeth into the mountain and seeketh that which is gone astray. And seeketh. That if at the end in the King James means a continual measure. It means that it's active. He seeketh. He seeketh. And he's patient in his pursuit. He doesn't give up. Praise the Lord. He's persistent in his pursuit. You know, all of us are familiar with the Christmas movies Home Alone and Home Alone 2, right? But think about how Kevin was left home alone in the first movie, right? And the parents realized it. 
after they had got on the plane and they were going over to France. By the way, there's biblical precedent for this. Jesus was left three days alone as a child in the temple, and it took three days for Mary and Joseph to realize that he was there. You see, Jesus is the original Kevin McAllister. (laughs) If you ever feel like you're a bad parent, just remember Mary and Joseph left their kid in the temple for three days and did not realize it until three days later. The mother and stepfather of Jesus, all right? So trust me, mom and dad, you're doing an okay job if you know where your kids are today. But think about it, church. Once she found out that Kevin was not there, she did everything in her power and she would not give up to get home to where Kevin was, right? She stayed at the airport. She wouldn't go to the hotel. She was bartering with people to get plane tickets. She flew to this place and that place and that place and that place. And finally, she got to Scranton, Scranton, Pennsylvania. She got to Scranton, and she got a van ride from Gus Belinsky to get home on Christmas to her son. There was nothing that was going to keep her from getting home on Christmas to her lost son. Listen to me, church. The same way Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, pursues his lost sheep. He pursues them persistently, and he pursues them with patience. He doesn't give up. I don't know about you, but after I look for something after a while, if I don't find it, I get frustrated and I give up. Not when it comes to the remote, but other things. (laughs) Can I tell you, sometimes it's one of our greatest weaknesses as Christians that we're in this world and we get fed up and frustrated with this world and sometimes we pray a prayer that we want to give up. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. I just wish the Lord would come back today. You know, if that's born out of an idea of you wanting to be in the presence of God, it's all well and good, but if it's a frustration with the world, you better check your heart. Because he's patient pursuing the lost sheep. That's why Peter said in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, he said, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But listen, is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If the Lord came back last month, think of how many people wouldn't have been saved that are saved right now. It just took that extra little bit to find that sheep. I praise God that Jesus didn't come back in 2000 because I would have been lost and not found. I praise God for his patience and his long suffering and pursuing his sheep that he doesn't give up. It's the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. It chases you down, it fights till you're found, And it leaves the 99. I I can't take credit for those lyrics. It's of a wonderful song. Because listen to me, that patience and that persistence in trying to find that lost sheep, you didn't earn it, you don't deserve it, but still he gives himself away. You see, there's good stuff even in the contemporary stuff, just like the old hymns. Church, that's what the shepherd does. He patiently and persistently pursues to find that lost sheep. Reminds me of that old hymn. The shepherd goes up into the mountains and he's calling for the sheep. Calling for the sheep. Calling for the sheep. Reminds me of that hymn that says, Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching. Watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, 
Jesus is calling. Calling the sinner. Come home. Look with me at the last two verses and then we'll close. It says, And if so be that he find it. Verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Can I show you something real quick? I promise. I'm going to wrap this up real quick. I promise. Because I've got a wonderful conclusion for you today. The one that wanders off, it's no guarantee that he will be found. That's what the beginning of verse 13 says. It says, and if so, be that he find it. Sometimes when the sheep wanders away, the shepherd can't get there quick enough. May not ever find it, or it may find it already dead. You know, there's a lot of reasons why we can wonder why a sheep would never be found by the shepherd. Maybe it wanders too far. Maybe the enemy finally gets in and gets a hold of it and has it for dinner. Maybe it can't hear the shepherd's voice. Or listen to me, maybe it does hear the shepherd's voice, but it doesn't have a heart that's willing to respond. Or maybe, just maybe, because of confusion and because of things that they were taught in their life, it's afraid of the shepherd. It knows it's not where it's supposed to be. And when he hears the shepherd calling, instead of coming, he keeps going away because he doesn't want the rod and the staff. I don't know what the reason may be, but I know that I've been in a lot of parts of my life where I can identify with each and every one of those. And the more I'm away from the shepherd and I don't hear to the shepherd's call, who's trying to seek and to save me, it doesn't get any better, church. It doesn't get any better. We're supposed to heed to the shepherd's searching. We're supposed to heed to the shepherd's voice. And look what happens, church. Look. When that shepherd finds the sheep, look at what it says. Verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth, rejoiceth more that that sheep than of the ninety-nine which went not astray. Luke 15 talks about a party being thrown. The shepherd picking up the sheep and carrying it back. It's rejoicing. Notice when the shepherd finds the sheep in the passage, there's no judgment on the sheep. There's no condemnation on the sheep. The sheep doesn't get lectured by the shepherd. There's no rebuke, there's no threats, and there's no punishment. The only thing that you see in this passage in Luke 15 is that shepherd, when he finds the sheep, loves on that sheep, gives mercy to the sheep, and brings relief to the sheep. He takes it home. He takes it home. Look at verse 14. It says, and even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. I don't know if you're lost because you're not saved this morning or maybe you've gone astray. (laughs) You know, it's interesting, the two parables that are told. One says that the sheep had gone astray. One says that the sheep was lost. I believe that's indicative for you and me today of someone who is not saved, but also the one that's gone astray, (laughs) the one who's saved but has walked away from the Lord. We can find any of us in this circumstance this morning. But listen to me. Listen to me, church. The whole point of this message and the whole point of Christmas time and the whole point of Jesus Christ coming and fulfilling the role of the Good Shepherd is that the will of God for your life is for you to be reconciled unto the Father through the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ. That's what it says. So maybe if you're here this morning and you're lost, Jesus is calling for you. Maybe you're here this morning and you've gone astray. Listen to me, the shepherd is 
speaking for you. Maybe you're here this morning in this Christmas season and you're scared and you're alone and you're upset and you're angry and you're at your wit's end. You've realized you've gone away from the flock. You've realized you've gotten yourself into some dangerous territory and you're crying out and you're crying out. Or maybe you just don't even know how to get back to where you were. Listen to me, church. There's hope this Christmas. There's hope this Christmas. Jesus Christ has come to seek and to save. He's come to pursue and rescue you. And there's no better way for me to wrap up this sermon, and there's no better way for me to wrap up this entire series than to let Jess Bless sing this song to you. And I would ask that you open your hearts and you allow the Holy Spirit to move and work. And if you are in need of prayer, heed to the shepherd's voice and come to the altar today and be rescued. been a moment you were forgotten you are not hopeless you have been broken your innocence stolen I hear you whisper underneath your breath I hear your SOS your SOS. I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night. It's true, I will rescue you. There is no distance cannot be covered over and over you're not defenseless i'll be your shelter i'll be your armor i hear you whisper underneath your breath i hear your s o s your 